Good morning, and welcome to this podcast service from the Pochester Methodist Church team. Our Methodist heritage here in this town in central South Africa traces its origins back to the work of Tswana catechist David Machata. Brother Machata had heard the gospel at the Dabanshi Mission, where he had taken refuge after escaping a life of slavery under King Mazedekatsi during the Difakan Wars of the 1820s. His twofold desire for his countrymen to learn of Jesus Christ and to be able to read and write led to his appointment as a Methodist catechist by the Reverend William Shaw. As a lay pastor who worked across a wide region all the way to Ladysmith in KwaZulu-Natal, and eventually his work as evangelist and educator came to the attention of Paul Kruger in the mid-1860s. At that time, Kruger was the Commandant General of the Boer Transvaal Republic, which had made Pochestrom its capital. Kruger invited Mr. Machata to come and preach and teach within the magisterial district of Pochestrom, and in this manner Methodism came to the people of this area. Once again, welcome to the service. My name is Edward Brown, and I am the latest link in a chain of Methodist clergy who have served in the footsteps of Father David Machata. Let us pray. Dear Father, beloved Son Jesus, eternal Holy Spirit, we praise your threefold name. Like the prophets and poets of old, we declare that not only are you our God, you are the only God. Lord God, we come before you in humble acknowledgement of our need for you at every level of our lives. We confess that more often than not, our lives are not what we had intend them to be. We often have been guilty of unwholesome words that sprang quickly to our lips when we have felt that others have abused or exploited us, and yet have probably trodden unknowingly on the rights of others during this past week. Please forgive us and make us more aware of the needs and feelings of those with whom we deal every day. Lord God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will strengthen us to remain vigilant to the wiles of the world around us. Give us the insight to recognize the sin which is often hidden behind attractive temptations and to have the spiritual strength to resist them so that every day we might experience the victory that our Master and Saviour Jesus Christ won on the cross. For we ask these things in his name and join in the prayer that he gave us praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Today's message will continue to follow the life of our Saviour Jesus Christ as we examine his great temptation in the wilderness. One of the hymns that best captures this dramatic event is George Hunt Smitten's Forty Days and Forty Nights. It is a hymn 165 in the Methodist hymnal. Forty days and forty nights you were fasting in the wild, forty days and forty nights tempted and yet undefiled. Sunbeams scorching all the day, chilly dewdrops nightly shed, prowling beasts about thy way, stones thy pillow, earth thy bed. Let us thy endurance share, and from earthly greed abstain, with thee watching unto prayer, with thee strong to suffer pain. And if Satan, vexing sore, flesh or spirit should assail, thou, his vanquisher, before, Grant we may not faint or fail. So shall we have peace divine, holier gladness ours shall be. Round us too shall angels shine, such as ministered to thee. Listen, today I have elected to read the account of the Lord Jesus' temptation from the record 
in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. We read from verse 1. Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where he was tempted by the devil for forty days. In all that time he ate nothing, so that he was hungry when it was over. The devil said to him, If you are God's son, order the stone to turn into bread. But Jesus answered, The scripture says, Man cannot live on bread alone. Then the devil took him up and showed him in a second all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you all this power and all this wealth, the devil told him. It has all been handed over to me, and I can give it to anyone I choose. All this will be yours, then, if you worship me. Jesus answered, The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and set him on the highest point of the temple and said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For the scripture says, God will order his angels to take care of you. It also says, They will hold you up with their hands so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. But Jesus answered, The scripture says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil finished tempting Jesus in every way, he left him for a while. May God bless the scripture to our understanding. Amen. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke all record that after Christ's baptism by his cousin John in the Jordan, that he retreated into solitude in the wilderness under the direction of the Holy Spirit. What is usually overlooked is that both Matthew and Luke use passive verb tenses to describe the action of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus. Mark, on the other hand, uses a strong present active verb tense to show the Lord Jesus was so totally filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit that God's will that he go into retreat became his own will, as if it was something he absolutely had to do. This time of solitude allowed Christ Jesus to prepare himself for the coming ministry that his heavenly Father had laid out for him. For forty days he would fast and pray to be absolutely certain that he was totally within the will of his Father. It was at the end of this time that he would face his great test at the hand of God's enemy. Some theologians have suggested that Christ in his half-starved situation only experienced hallucinations of the deceiver, but I differ. This was no figurative battle. I believe that the Lord had a personal encounter with the fallen archangel. And to those who dismiss the reality of this being, I would say that there are just too many accounts of meeting him personally, sometimes brutally personal accounts, that were written by people who have been saved out of the occult and into the light and love of the Heavenly Father. It must have been a great moment for the father of lies. And he would have been alone. His pride would never have allowed any demonic minion to be present, lest that creature attempt to share in his desired triumph. No, here at last, on his own terms, Satan could battle for sovereignty over creation with the severely handicapped heir of creation. He could throw all the great temptations at the half-starved Son of God, and if Christ Jesus faltered on the smallest point, he would win it all. Jesus was literally thrust into a one-on-one -on -one battle with the ruler of the evil realm. We must also remember a very important truth. Jesus of Nazareth was capable of falling into sin. The temptations were thrown at him had as much chance of succeeding in defeating him as they might have if you or I faced them. You see, and this is something many of us overlook, Jesus had two full natures. One was human and the other was divine. But he had forbidden himself to use his divine nature in order to live a totally human life. In his human strength, and in that strength alone, he had to be victorious. But to do that, he had to deny his fleshly human desires and submit totally to God's will in a way that no man had ever done before or since. 
In Luke's account of the three temptations that Christ Jesus faced, we can see in broad outline every temptation that everyday ordinary people like you and me face. The first temptation was aimed at the physical, physical being of the Lord. It was a temptation of the flesh. During the 40 days of the Lord Jesus' retreat, two things had happened to him. His many hours, days and weeks of prayer and meditation had strengthened his spiritual relationship with his father immeasurably, but his fast had depleted his bodily reserves. Doctors are in agreement that during fasting the body first uses up all fat resources and then begins to consume itself. Critical life-threatening starvation is reached during the sixth week without food. After 40 days, Jesus was well into the stage of starvation. For the enemy, this physically exhausted and weakened state made the Lord ripe for the attack on the physical plane, and the obvious need for food was the perfect target. Now we must understand that there is nothing either right or wrong about being hungry. Hunger is a natural state and is therefore morally neutral. It is the way in which that hunger is satisfied that determines whether sin against God's laws is committed or not. Luke records the temptation as, If you are the Son of God, order the stone to turn into bread. Now this appears at first glance to be an innocent enough suggestion. But there was a very sharp barb attached, and the Lord Jesus saw it. The time that he had just spent with his father had confirmed in him the knowledge of his divine nature. But along with that had also come the understanding that he had come to face life and defeat sin as a human being. No human being can create fruit from a rock, only God can. So although it was within his power to do so, in fact, Christ Jesus could have created a complete banquet for himself in a moment. Had he done so, he would never be able to claim victory over the physical problem of hunger that every man, woman and child face, because he would have cheated to help himself. But more than this, he would be sinning against his father, for his actions would proclaim that he did not trust God enough to prevent him from starving to death. Let me put it another way. If he produced food for himself, he would never in any honesty be able to say, I have lived and triumphed as a man as God willed for my life. Because he would have interrupted his human life for a brief moment to act as only God could act. Christ Jesus saw this all in this temptation. Oh yes, creating food would prove that he was the son of God. But he knew that if he was to be a real man, indeed God's perfect man, he would have to defeat sin and everyday problems like hunger or lust in the same way that every other person does and content himself to live as ordinary folk live. This temptation was one to the flesh and all of us face such temptations daily. The nature of this temptation is to satisfy normal bodily wants and needs in a way that is either illegal or immoral. Physical needs must be disciplined and controlled. Had Christ performed this miracle for himself, he would be no different from the man who stole a loaf of bread from the village market to feed himself. A person's physical body needs to be subservient and dependent on the spiritual laws of God. People need food, but that food must be obtained through processes approved by God and must acknowledge that nourishment is not only tied to our physical bodies, but also to our spiritual relationship to God. And so the Lord turns this temptation away with the words, man cannot live on bread alone, implying what St. Matthew's record of this temptation adds, namely, but needs every word that comes from God. Christ knew only too well that physical food only had a temporary action, the spiritual food of God, which nourished the immortal spirit, had eternal benefit. Having failed in his first temptation, the enemy changed his tactics. Luke records the second temptation as one of greed for power and positions. Here Christ Jesus offered political power on an unimaginable scale. The dream of every tyrant, he could rule over the whole world. 
the deceiver had taken the rulership over creation from Adam, who with Eve had fallen at the temptation of the flesh. God had commanded, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it had looked so appealing. And so Eve had eaten and shared with her husband. And with that act of disobedience, the mantle of power over creation had fallen from their shoulders and been quickly donned illegally by the serpent. Now in this temptation, the serpent offered a shortcut to worldwide dominion to the Lord Jesus. It was a temptation to bypass the cross completely because he would be the ruler of the world. But once again, Christ saw the hidden poison. To receive that authority, he would have to grant the enemy the same status that he gave his father God in the act of worship, and thus commit the grossest violation of all. And so Christ rejects this offer with, the scripture says, worship the Lord and serve only him. Furthermore, Christ Jesus knew that if he received any kind of authority from the hand of the illegal overlord, that he himself later called the ruler of this world, he would, like Adam, never be free from demonic influence. Today this temptation comes as shortcuts to success. We're invited to turn a blind eye to this or that devious or dishonest business practice or deal because it will help one to reach one's goal far easier and more quickly. Some years ago, a couple of businessmen who were leading members of their respective churches confided in me that the paying of bribes was the common business practice when dealing with government departments in the provincial capital where we lived. Christians can never compromise. For as the Lord Jesus knew only too well, selling out to the devil will never bring lasting success. Having failed again, the enemy once again changed his tactics, and Luke records a third temptation as the desire for spiritual power. It's important for all Christians to know that Siva is shown in this temptation to use scripture to achieve his goals. Not everyone who quotes the Bible at you to make a point is a child of God, so beware of this ploy. Here the Lord Jesus is tempted again, the immediate support of the Jewish religious leaders and perhaps even their worship by performing a public miracle in the temple precincts. Now, we must remember that the spiritual acknowledgement by the people of Israel was Christ's divine right. He was Emmanuel, their God who was among them, and he was entitled to be worshipped. But it would be improper if it resulted from a single act of showmanship. He knew that he had to show that he was worthy of being worshipped by a life of love and service to his heavenly Father and the world. And so he rejected this possible future, saying, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Thus reminding us all that we must never try to manipulate God into doing what we desire. It is a fact that there have always been people who have tried to gain spiritual power over their neighbours in order to exploit them. Pastors who spray their congregants with insecticides, or who promise miraculous healings, if you pay money into the accounts. Preachers who claim that they alone have been given the understanding to unlock God's word and that all others are wrong. And then there are the interpreters of the occult who claim to be able to reveal your future through horoscopes, interpreting omens or by calling up your dead loved ones. All these things are prohibited in the Bible. Modern Christians can accidentally place themselves under the spiritual power of false healers who use alternative Eastern pseudo-medical practices. Some years ago, a local district surgeon told me how people had died in our region because they had first gone for treatment to one such quack, an ex-nun, before going too late for proper medical treatment. One of my members later told me that she had also been a patient at that clinic, but had never been truly healthy until she had stopped going there and had confessed that sin to God. Like the temptation that our Lord faced, these things appear to offer something good, but they come at a price that may be too high to pay. When we look at the temptations of our Lord, 
we see that he won his victory by the power of God's truth as recorded in Scripture. When we know our Bible so well that we can quote Scripture, we will find ourselves more easily able to reject the temptations of the world. If the Lord Jesus took the time to know Scripture well enough to be able to quote it, then we cannot afford to do less. In this way, we will have victory as Christ did. Pledge yourself today to reading and knowing God's Word. It is bread to eternal life. Amen. I close this service with the high priestly blessing found in Numbers 6 verse 24. May the Lord bless you and guard you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. Amen.